uh, I have an out note. I'm going to read. Uh, it's going to help you hopefully follow the, um, the longer quotations that I'm going to bring. Um, it's funny that the, the German chapter of this project has a Hebrew accent, an Israeli accent. <laughs> um, the, the, real, uh, the real title of this talk is um, Gustav Landau, Martin Buber, and the Invention of Jewish Mysticism. And it's a, it's a direct continuation of uh, what uh, Boaz discussed in the morning. It's also a little polemical. I hope well, we'll see what happens. Um, well, you'll see what happens. <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a first chapter of a book project that I'm... Uh, uh, planning and and maybe we can we can discuss uh, be glad to discuss the further aspects of the project in the discussion so in November 1908 Leo Hellman a young student and the chairman of the Bar Kochva Jewish uh, Student Association Prague wrote the already famous Martin Buber a letter inviting him to speak in an evening devoted to the decline of Judaism the students, he wrote, wanted to hear Buber discuss the following question, a quote from the letter. How can Western Jews return to the fold of the Jewish essence? This was the penultimate question of an increasing number of Jewish men and women of this age who grew in a highly acculturated environment, but nevertheless sought some kind of recourse to their Jewish heritage. Martin Buber accepted the invitation to come to Prague to deliver what we would what would be the first of three lectures that will shape Central European Zionism, later published under the title Drei Reden über das Judentum. Hans Kohn, who was present in the lectures and who would become a Zionist activist a leading, and a leading scholar of nationalism, wrote Buber shortly after the first lecture. You know, Herr Doktor, what your addresses meant to us, the members of the Bar Kochva Society. However, I may say with certainty, that they did not mean for anyone else what they meant for me, since for me they were, in many respects, a turning point. Upon reading the addresses, Franz Rosenzweig wrote Bubel, I am amazed to see to what degree you have become a representative speaker of the generations, mine as well as the one after me. Years later, Gershom Scholem noted that the three lectures or the three addresses exuded considerable magic in their time, and he added, I would be unable to mention any other book about Judaism in these years, which even came close to having such an effect among the youth that has here heard the summons for a new departure. What was it that so many heard in Buber's address? What motivated so many into action and how? In this short presentation, I want to argue that Buber's call summoned the youth because it was essentially essentially equated two highly suggestive and powerful notions, mysticism and Zionism, into a one central metaphor. Buber thus offered a vision which was at the same time highly individual, yet held the promise of a common togetherness, the promise of a community that also reaches into the religious past. In order to understand Buber and the way he fused Zionism and mysticism, it is essentially to take a closer look at the first address, this notion of Zionism, and the context from which he draws the term mysticism. But first, I would like to make this very clear, this is not a talk about Martin Buber. Buber's vision of Zionism and his concept of mysticism were thoroughly discussed by, scho by scholars. My concern here, therefore, is not so much an examination of Buber's philosophy. Rather, I want to discuss the idea that def defined an entire edifice of thought and end of imagination, namely that of Jewish mysticism. As Boaz Hus convincingly, very convincingly showed, I think, no single person has contributed more to the category, to the creation of the category of Jewish mysticism than Martin Buber. Buber, however, didn't work alone. The fact that is that he operated within a certain social and philosophical context. The word mysticism was in this context, of course, not just a word. But, has, but had a specific meaning, which stems from a specific discourse dealing with certain questions. It is therefore impossible to understand Buber's mysticism, nor his Zionism, nor his use of the category Jewish mysticism without carefully examining the context in which he has done so. And this is what I would like to do today. But first, we have to roll back to Prague. 
even in hindsight, Bubo's addresses are impressive for their scope and ambition. Bubo opened his first lecture raising the very central question of his Jewish secular modern society. I quote, The question I put before you, as well as before myself, is the question of the meaning of Judaism for the Jews. And he adds, Why do we call ourselves Jews? Because we are Jews? What does that mean, we are Jews? I want to speak to you today, of abs not of abstractions, but of your own life, of our own lives. Mostly, Buba notes, this question elicits two kinds of answers, arguing namely that Judaism is either a nation or a religion. Is there a Jewish religion? Buba asks. His answer is negative. I quote, as for inner reality, Jewish religiosity is a memory, perhaps a hope, but, it is not, but has no presence. As a nation, Buba argues, Judaism cannot be any more imagined. I quote, all the elements that might constitute a, nations are, a nation are missing. Neither the land the Western Jew lives in, nor the language he speaks, nor the way of life he participates in, belong to a community of blood. Buba critique was unrelent unrelenting. Jews, he claimed, were essentially barred from Judaism. Individuals were alienated, and the substance that held them together lost its holding power long ago. This was the essence of his social diagnosis, and it seems telling that his words were so enthusiastically received by his young listeners. It seems telling, furthermore, that Wozenzweig seemed uh, wrote to say, somewhat begrudgingly perhaps, that Buber's words emb embodied the voice of generations. But if neither nationality nor religion holds the promise for the future of the Jewish people, if neither can carry the weight of millions who do not share any more a geography, a spirituality, or a tongue, then how are the Jews to become Jewish? How are they to constitute a community, a Gemeinschaft, the German word is very important, in this deepest imaginable sense, rather than taking up a petrified religion or fighting for an imagination, Buba suggests Buba suggest that Jews follow the path leading inwards. The path to Judaism, Buber insists, is the voyage into one's own self. And I'm reading quote, quotation number one. When out of our deepest self-knowledge we have affirmed ourselves, when we have said yes to ourselves and to our whole Jewish existence, then our feeling will no longer be the feeling of individuals. Every individual among us will feel that he is the people, for he will feel the people within himself. We shall therefore not view Judaism's past as the past of a community to which we belong, but shall behold in it the early history of our own lives. There, Buber claims in the interiority of each and every individual, lays the root of the Jewish community. There, therefore, only a deep personal meditation and a vowel to an inward Judaism a commitment to one's own truth might yield a free and authentic Jewish society. Buber's call for inwardness was not received with his enthusiasm alone. Even among the Balkochva students, and definitely within the larger circles of the German Jewish youth, Buber's solution met resistance and criticism. But the point here is not so much the philosophical veracity of Buber's claim, but rather their historical value. In his first address, Buba issued an unmistakable call to action, assigning each and every member of the Jewish youth a quasi-messianic role. He does so explicitly in the very last lines of the first address. I quote uh, from number two. When I was a child, Buba said, I read an old Jewish tale I could not understand. It said no more than this. Outside the gates of Rome there sits a leprous beggar waiting. He is the Messiah. Then I came upon an old man whom I asked, who is he waiting for? And the old man gave an, me an answer I did not understand at the time, an answer I learned to understand only much later. He said, he's waiting for you. This is how the first address ends. Buber, and Buber seems to say he's waiting for each and every one of us, that we finally commit to building a Jewish Gemeinschaft. This was Buber's message and it resonated far and wide. 
it did so precisely because it, it turned the social, religious, and political issues at hand into a personal and existential question. And it has accords each, accorded each and every individual the power to change and to create the political and social project of Zionism, the attempt to revolutionize the existence of the Jewish people and renew the spiritual promise of Judaism, received, received here a unique personal yet communal meaning. Bubel charged Zionism with the power of mysticism. The term mysticism must be understood in this context as a solution to a problem which in the history of philosophy is often named the problem of individuation. This problem was best and most form forcefully formulated by Otto Schopenhauer. According to Schopenhauer, man can know for certain only two things. He can know the world as it appears to him, and he can know his own will. In other words, man is forever locked inside himself, unable to say anything about the, word, the world as it really is. We therefore see things, but not their essence, nor their common meaning, and nor, or their in a reality which remains woefully beyond our reach. The world, therefore, is every bit fragmented, arbitrary, and incomplete as it appears to us. Only a generation after Kant's critique of pure reason, Schopenhauer's suggestion that reason cannot, because of its very structure, perceive, this, uh, perceive the world and the things in the world as they really are, but only in their individual appearances, sent a shiver down the spine of European philosophy. Bubel was a student of Schopenhauer's philosophy, and his interest in mysticism can be traced back to Schopenhauer's pioneering insight. Indeed, Bubel's PhD, his dissertation, titled On the History of the Problem of Indiv Individuation, Nicolas of Cusa and Jakob Bume, was meant to be part of a larger historical philosophical project about the problem of individuation, which never materialized, materialized. yet. His choice to dedicate the dissertation to two mystics seems highly telling. Schopenhauer himself suggested that mysticism might break the bond of individuation. It was true, Schopenhauer insisted, human reason can never hope to detect the unifying principle that hold this world together. But, he argued, the ascetic in the height of the mystical trance might go beyond and experience the world as one. Buber's choice to write about the problem of individuation from the perspective of two mysticism is a clear continuation and development of Schopenhauer's insight about mysticism. It is essential here to see that Buber's early interest in mysticism is not religious in any simple sense of the word, but rather philosophical. In other words, the search for a point of view from which the world can be understood as one, as a unified essence, was not a product of ascetic practices, nor did it originate from any ambition to intensify the religious feeling, or to better describe the inner life of God, it was neither theological nor psychological. Rather, it was motivated primarily by the concern about the very foundation of human understanding, and possibly also by an excessive reading of Kant, Schopenhauer, and of Schopenhauer's best well-known student, Friedrich Nietzsche. Can man, can man understand the world? German philosophy at the zenith of its influence in the late 19th century seemed to have answered this question negatively and started to search for an alternative for itself. Mysticism was thus invented as a universal and philosophical concept as a path to an essence that reason could not supply. But while the first concern that motivated Buber's inquiry into mysticism was philosophical, the social and political came at a close second. Unity is indeed an essential characteristic of knowledge, but it is also an important aspect of community, of Gemeinschaft, especially if that community wants to mobilize itself into action. How can a community define itself as a unified entity if the very fact of unity is put into question? How can, we, how can a community engage in the world and in direct action if it cannot identify itself as one? These are the question that the problem of individuation lays at the feet of political leaders, most importantly at the feet of socialists who were active at this period and sought to imagine an entire class rising up together, taking what was already theirs. No one, it seems to me, was more acutely aware of these questions than the famous activist, socialist, anarchist, and an early admirer of Nietzsche, a student of Schopenhauer's philosophy and a close friend of Martin Buber, 
by the name of Gustav Landau. Landau was born in 1870 and Jew to Jewish parents in Karlsruhe and went to study in Heidelberg and Berlin. He became a leading figure in socialist and anarchist circles, a publisher, a writer, and a political activist. In 1918, he joined the revolutionary government in Munich that was created with the collapse of the central government at the end of the First World War. And he was murdered in, nine, in May 1919 by the members of the Freikorps, a para paramilitary militia that stormed Un Munich and overrun the fledgling republic. At the core of Landauer's thought was an attempt to envision a society which was both free and cohesive. Landauer denounced any form of domin domination and was especially troubled by the domination of state apparatus and the use of violence in state affairs. He was an anarchist and a pacifist. So it was great, great different from the Russian anarchist, by the way. And on the other hand, he believed that the person cannot be free in a society from which he felt alienated. Landauer anarchist vision can therefore be described as a community of Nietzschean supermen and women, all free from domination, violence, and terror, each free to pursue his or her own destiny. Yet, in an important divergence from the Nietzschean ideal of the superman, all these supermen and women ought to work in Landauer's thinking together in order to, to, to achieve what was essentially a common goal, a free and cohesive community, Gemeinschaft, for all. Obviously, this vision of community suffers from a deep underlying tension. How can one imagine a community of free individuals that are also deeply committed to each other and to a common goal? Landauer devoted his most important philosophical work, known as Skepticism Mystique, that's the title, to this very question. In a more succinct way, he addressed it also in a lecture that he gave in front of the radical socialist group in Berlin called the Neue Gemeinschaft in June 1900. This, lectures, uh, this lecture starts with the following words. For those, who, for those of us who see ourselves as part of the vanguard, the distance to the rest of humankind has become enormous. Here, Landau does not talk about the distance between the educated elite and the general society. He discussed, rather, the differences that arise from a constructed social categories that are imposed on the individual from the outside, such as race, religion, profession, and so forth. How then can individuals strive for a unified community in a world built upon segregating categories? That's the question. Landau's answer, I hope you guessed it by now, is inwardness. I quote number three. The way to create a community that encompasses the entire world leads not outwards, but inwards. We must realize that we do not just perceive the world, but that we are the world. So let us return completely to ourselves then we may truly find the universe. Universe, Let us make it very clear to us that as long as we perceive our own inner nature as reality, all matter is indeed a spook, imagined by our own eyes, our touch, and our perception of space as external. Let us make it entirely clear to us that inner perception only depends on spirit. Landau drew this notion it is interesting to note, from the writing of the Dominican theologian, philosopher, and mystic Eckhart von Hochheim, also known as Meister Eckhart, I quote, Meister Eckhart says that God is not one with the individual, but with humanity. It is humanity that all individuals have in common. It is humanity that gives them value. It is the highest and finest in all individuals' life. This is what Meister Eckhart calls human nature. Indeed, the main thrust of Landor's most important work is that mysticism is also a social endeavor, or rather, a condition for social unity, and it, he attributes this insight to Meister Eckhart. Gustav Landau's readings of Meister Eckhart has a profound, had profound influence at their time, but most importantly, it shaped Martin Buber's notion of community. According to the foremost scholar of Buber's thought, Pullman de Flo, Landau's precise notion can be traced in Buber's writing in his mature philosophy. It is also clearly visible in his addresses to the Jewish Student Association at the University of Prague. In this lecture, Buber discusses the path by which a society construes the different identity within it. At first, Buber contends, the individual finds himself in a cosmos constituted by his own impressions. 
and these impressions defined his sense of belonging and loyalty. But some individual realizes that the inner feeling is stronger than the external reality. I quote, on the first level, Buba says, his people represents the world to him. Now, they represent his soul. The people are now for him a community of men, of men who were, are, and will be. Together, they constitute a community, a Gemeinschaft. These assertions follow closely behind Landau's analysis. And he also quotes uh, Landau. So. But with one essential modification, whereas Landau's community was universal and synchronic, so that it encompassed all present people, Buber's community was national and diachronic. In his addresses, Buba was, taking, was talking to a Jewish audience about the question of their Judaism, about the desire to re-enter the fold of their nation. And he told them, in, t in terms taken directly from Landauer's mystical anarchy, that they need not take anything from the external manifestation of the Jewish religion, nor remain loyal to a specific piece of land or even to a certain group of people. They must reach, rather, deep into their own selves and find there the message of the Jewish generations. I quote, whoever realized the pathos of his inner struggles will discover that there still lives within him an element whose great national prototype is the struggle of the prophets. Every single Jew, Buber commands, must meditate and practice the secret mysticism of community. I quote number four. In those stillest hours when we sense the ineffable, we become aware of the deep schism of our existence. To attain unity, a unity within division, we must become aware of the significance of blood within us. For in the hustle of our days, we are consciousness, we're conscious only of the world around us. Let the vision of those stillest hours penetrate even more deeply. Let us behold, let us comprehend ourselves, let us hold ourselves, let us draw our life into our own hands as a pail out of the well. Let us gather it into our hands as one gathered scattered corn. We must come to a decision. We must establish the balance of powers within us. The solution Buba thus offers to the problem of Jewish separation is therefore not religion, nor nation, but rather mysticism. And the sense that he took, that rose from Schopenhauer's philosophy and then adapted to the social sphere by Gustav Landauer. This is, I argue, the meaning and essence of Buber's Zionism, or at least his early Zionism. For Buber, therefore, Zionism, which is the ultimate experiment of modern Judaism and its most radical attempt to renewal, had to be motivated by radical inwardness if it was to allow its members complete freedom, yet at the same time offer them a prospect of a social cohesion, of a community, of a Gemeinschaft. I hope I have convinced you, or at least started to convince you, that Buba's notion of Jewish mysticism stemmed from an application of a certain discourse to the Jewish case. Jewish mysticism is a development of thinking of Arthur Schopenhauer and Gustav Landau, among others, and it rose in certain concerns about knowledge, freedom, and society as they were applied to the Jewish case. I hope it has also become clear why Buba's call has resonated so deeply with his young audience. For the first time, Jews felt able to face the questions that rattled European thinkers as Jews. For the first time, in other words, someone answered Schopenhauer's question in uniquely Jewish terms. And for the first time, Jews were given the hope that they might succeed where all other European nations were about to fail. They were detained, they were destined, I'm sorry, they were destined to create a community. It was in their blood or at least so spoke the prophet Martin Buber. But at the point, uh, but the point of this lecture goes beyond Buber's scholarship. It seeks to examine the idea called Jewish mysticism. As Boz Hus notes and noted, Kabbalists and Hasidism did not need the term mysticism. Hebrew offers no substitute for the word. But Buber needed it, and his audience needed it too. And it was Buber, because of the very specific meaning applied this term to a certain subset of Jewish traditions and texts. I've tried to explain why they did so, and for what reasons. Jewish mysticism, I've tried to suggest, was the path of Jewish individuals, the path they could take in search of a renewed Judaism. Jewish mysticism was Zionism, one of the many forms of this ideolo ideology that 
that was discussed in the early 20th century. It was also philosophy. It faced off against some of the deepest problem of modern thought. It was a social anarchist program, as it was adapted for the works of Gustav Landauer. Most surprising at all, at least for, from my perspective, it was based on an interpretation of text of a medieval Dominican monk. Bubo was not the first to use the term Jewish mysticism, but his shaping was decisive. One last word. Many things have been said about Gershom Scholem. The man who has contributed more than any other individual to the standardization of Jewish mysticism for defining its perimeter and historical arch. One thing is clear, he was a very careful reader. He was intimately familiar with the works of Kant, Schopenhauer, and Nietzsche. He was deeply moved by Landor's anarchism. Most of all, he was a student of Martin Buber. In fact, his description of the youth reaction to the Drei Reden describes also his own reaction. Buber's address have beyond doubt exuded considerable magic on him, for he has heard in them, in them the summons to a new departure. He was well aware of the meaning Buber gave to Jewish mysticism, and he carried it on with him for many years to come. Thank you very much.